We are delighted to welcome award-winning photographer and instructor Vinnie Colucci as our guest presenter for our Singway webinar this evening. With a passion that spans over four decades since the inception of his phot photographic journey in 1979, Vinnie has refined his techniques while capturing the beauty of landscapes and wildlife from the serene North Carolina shores to the majestic Canadian Rockies. Alongside his partner in life and art, Annette, Vinny hosts a number of nature and wildlife photography workshops throughout the year, and he loves to share his insights and techniques with photographers of all abilities and interests. Vinny's portfolio has graced the pages of publications including Popular Photography Magazine, Ner Nature Photographer Magazine, Newburn Travel Magazine, and Microwave Journal, among others. His compelling imagery can also be found in books that he has authored and co-authored. And with that, Vinny, I will let you take it. Thank you. I appreciate I appreciate your introduction, Michelle, and I appreciate Singray for inviting me back um, to do a presentation. And uh, I hope the group that's listening gets something out of it. Um, as we go through the slideshow, you will notice um, my email pops up now and then. So if we don't get to a question today, feel free to email me and... Uh, and we'll get your answers covered. And you might pose a question I don't know, and I'll state that too. We won't try to pretend we know an answer to anything. We want you guys to walk away with some information. I do want to make a. Uh, I do want to make this statement. Um, I'm going to show you things that I do and things that I believe work for me. Um, it's not my way or the highway, guys. I mean, you could learn from many different instructors, even in my own workshop programs. Um, things like we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, I always have my group share. We, I want people to learn from the, each other, not just from me. I, um, I'm not the, uh, you know, say it all person and you have to follow everything I say, but these are techniques that have worked for me and you could add maybe to your portfolio and give them a try and see if they work. So hopefully uh, we give you some things to think about. Yes, it's it's pretty obvious. I I'm a Nikon shooter. As we go through the program, I will probably uh, show some things that are shot with all of my Nikon gear. But I have shot Canon and Sony and Fuji along the way. I need to do that to be able to help folks to come to my my programs uh, that uh, don't happen to shoot Nikon. Let me. It's not about the camera. I I don't like to get involved with camera wars. Um, so. Uh, it's really about the photography and whatever feels good to you and whatever you could master as a piece of equipment is what you need as a photographer. And that goes from the, you know, the iPhone all the way up to the highest level Canon or Sony or Nikon uh, system that's out there. Um, so please don't look at this as this, is, I've got to change to a Nikon. Nikon would love you to obviously, but this is about, techniques that'll work on any mirrorless camera so hopefully uh you could translate some of the terminology if i don't know it to your particular system uh and of course if you happen to be shooting nikon it'll make a immediate sense to you just because that's what i shoot um, when we're shooting wildlife not just mirrorless but even back in slr days or film days for that matter um there's certain equipment we need. We need larger telephoto lens for wildlife, whether it's birding, whether it's uh, big cats or grizzly bears or black bears. Um, you know, we need telephoto lenses. That doesn't mean you shouldn't have a shorter lens like a 24 to 70 with you, but we strive to usually try to get as close as we can to our wildlife through optics. This way we don't disturb what they're doing out there and it also keeps them safe and us safe at the same time so this is some of the type of equipment that uh, we need to have in our repertoire as we go venture out for wildlife type shooting <coughs> excuse me i want to mention you know this program is not specifically a filter program uh it, it's about what it says but I do use polarizers quite a bit when photographing wildlife. And I have a lot of colleagues. I've had other professional and really advanced wildlife photographers challenge me on that. And I've used polarizers for years and years and years 
in wildlife um because they say oh it, it doesn't make sense you know what i have found whenever i could use it whenever i can use a polarizer it controls scattered light even in fur even in feathers and it gives a, a pop to the image that I can't get when I don't use a polarizer. Of course, when it, sometimes it gets really late in the afternoon and, and the polarizer really takes away too much light. Uh, my other choice is the Hilux filter, which is sort of a clear filter, UV filter. A lot of people use UV filters as a lens protection filter, but the Hilux is a little different. It's the only reason I use it. Um, it adds a little contrast, adds a little warmth, besides taking care of the ultraviolet. So most of the time, I'm on a polarizer. If it gets a little too dark and I'm losing too much light, my ISO is getting too high, I switch over to the Hilux. So those are the two filters I use in all my wildlife shooting. And I know we're talking a lot about wildlife tonight, but I actually use a polarizer to reduce glare on a lot of product photography as well, which is not something we talk about a lot at Sing Ray. Oh, absolutely. And, and you, you know, you talk about the difference, you, you know, tonight's about wildlife, but one of the reasons and part of the challenge I recently had to explain to somebody on, on Facebook was when I'm photographing wildlife amongst foliage and the foliage is wet and the sun's in the wrong position and you have all these shiny spots in the foliage behind the wildlife, it takes away from the wildlife, but a polarizer will tame that down more so than really helping the actual photo of the uh, the animal or the bird. Um, it, it tames down scattered light, which allows your image to pop off the page a little bit better. And in product photography, which I do, I used to do quite a bit of back in the 90s and early 2000s, myself, you know, product and commercial photography, polarizers could control light there also. I've used them when I used to shoot weddings. I mean, back in the 90s and early 2000s, I used to shoot 25 30 weddings a year. And then I figured out it was much safer to be in front of a grizzly bear than a bridezilla and a mom. So I moved away from that. And now I'm strictly a wildlife photographer and nature photographer. Uh, but yeah, um, polarizers are a big tool in, um, in my bag for doing things. And part of that's because I minimize my post-processing. If you're a guru post-processor, you can get away with a lot of things on the computer, my average image takes less than 30 seconds to process and I'm on to the next one. Uh, and that includes all the images you're gonna see tonight. Um, the other thing we have to consider in equipment with wildlife and photography, birding photography, uh, VR and image stabilization is incredible with our mirrorless cameras. But when I get to use a tripod and a gimbal head or a ball head, I still get better images, particularly if I have to shoot slower shutter speeds, for example, and we'll talk about this later. Um, if I want wing movement on a bird or an eagle flying by, hand holding might not give me um, the collection I want as far as not having uh, throwaways. So being on a gimbal head, for example, um, gives me back um, that stability that uh, that I can't handle uh, hand holding. I'm 68. I can't hand hold even with VR as well as I probably could have back when I was 38. So tripod is still a active and big part of my camera collection uh, as far as equipment when I go in the field. Camera setups. We're going to be talking about things like RAW and JPEG and sharpening and color space in the camera. Do we use back button focusing or do we just do the shutter button focusing? Uh, so we'll talk about that as we go through the setups. You'll see photos coming up as I hit these points and basically most of them have my settings and what I did here, including, as you can see, a polarizer in this shot. Um, so that'll give you an idea of what the setup looked like as I captured the image and maybe why it came out. In camera sharpening, you know, Almost all of our cameras, and I say almost all because I haven't picked up every camera that Canon's made or every can camera that Sony's made. Um, I believe in-camera sharpening is available in all of our mirrorless cameras. And I always push it up. And the reason I push it up, because now we could, when we import into software like Lightroom, we could pull over our camera settings. So those previews we see, even though it's a raw image, the previews we see translate some of these settings that our cameras could control. 
Uh, I don't usually change the other ones like clarity and, and so forth from what came out of the box, but sharpening I push up to eight or nine uh, because they typically come out of the box set to about four, which is great if I was a portrait photographer to soften skin tones, but not if I'm trying to get a sharp image of an eagle going by at 35 miles an hour. Also in your camera, um, you have the ability to change your color space. All the cameras come out um, of the box in sRGB, which collects 256 tones of color. And it's really poppy. So if I was going to go right from the camera to Walgreens and make a print, that's the way to shoot. But if I'm going to do any processing in a roll and I want the maximum information for that software to, to work with my raw image, change it to Adobe RGB, and you'll collect about 64,000 tones of color transitions. So it's just a smoother transition. We're talking about wildlife tonight, but imagine a pastel sunset and the transition through the different colors will be much finer on large prints if you are switched to Adobe RGB. The fallback is it shoots a little flat. So you are forced to add contrast in your post-processing versus srgb uh which pops and i have i have a client that comes to a lot of workshops and she absolutely does almost no processing she takes her card she goes to walgreens makes a bunch of prints and i have her shooting srgb because that's better for her so a lot of this depends on your shooting style it's not a set it this way this is the only way to do it it's what works for you and uh but you need to try them you need to go out and try the different uh different things in your camera so you can see what you like back button focusing versus shutter button focusing a lot of people jumped on back button focusing years ago you know why because the internet said all the pros shooting back button focusing well i know a bunch of wildlife and birding photographer pros including myself we don't use back button focusing because it affected the way in my case my shooting style i like to move my focus sensor around for compositional purposes. We'll talk about that later. But if I do that with back button focusing, every time I want to move my little joystick behind the camera, you can see to the right, uh, every time I do that, I have to release the shutter, the, the focus button, which means I've disengaged the autofocus. By using shutter button focusing, I can follow my my subject around, I could move the sensor around with my thumb, and I'm still right there on my autofocus, ready to press the shutter to shoot a nice little burst and, and capture what I want. That's my shooting style. One's not better than the other. One is different than the other. You have to see what you like to perfect. Um, there's also plenty of wildlife pros I know that use back button focusing. Um, I probably use that more if I myself if I was a landscape photographer solely, where I could use it uh, and set things up and change composition and hold the original autofocuses. So again, figure out what works for you. Um, I'm letting you know what works for me. If uh, if you like one over the other, stick with it. One word of advice: Vinny's tip number one of the night. If you go set your camera up for let's say rear or back button focusing and you have multiple camera bodies set them all up the worst thing that can happen is you're in the field with two camera bodies you grab one and you don't remember what focus button to press as a nice grizzly bear comes walking across the field and you miss the shot so always have both of your cameras or if you have three or three of your cameras set the same way so you don't have to think about it in the field Pick your exposure mode. You know, um, Nikon calls it 3D matrix metering. Um, other other companies call it something different. But the matrix metering or the uh, AI, you know, the AI metering in, in like the Canon systems, um, they're a computerized uh, help to doing your exposure. In Nikon, for example, and all the others do something similar, wherever you're autofocusing on and, and metering on, it's looking at that exposure and it's also measuring red, green, and blue. It's measuring the distance and light fall off between your camera sensor and the actual subject. And it's going into a computer bank um, and looking at with the Nikon system over 30,000 images in the computer bank and finding one that's very similar to what you're shooting and making a minor adjustment. 
if you go to something like spot metering, it disengages that computer or down in, in the lower corner there, center weight metering, it disengages the computer. I don't typically use center weight anymore. I'm either in 3D color matrix metering or I'm in spot metering. A lot of camera companies have added spot metering with a little bit of matrix. They're usually designated with the spot metering symbol and an asterisk. That means that you're disengaging the full matrix. You're not looking at those 30,000 images anymore, but you're protecting things like backlighting or rim lighting. So I have experimented with that. I find I'm just better off if I need to in complicated light, just going right to spot metering. Each mode has its own purpose, whether you're shooting manual exposure, aperture, priority, shutter priority, uh, or the full program mode, or the professional mode, as we call it. Obviously, most of us probably don't shoot in the program mode because uh, that's sort of a point-and-shoot mode. But I want to mention this. The program mode allows you to at least adjust uh, using your exposure compensation button. If your image is too dark or too light, you could adjust the exposure in program mode versus if you have a camera that has a little green camera on top, which you switch to that's sort of a program mode that you you're not doing anything it's just a point and shoot camera and whatever the camera thinks the right exposure should be is what you're going to get i shoot primarily in manual or manual with auto iso and the reason for that is in manual i could choose the, the aperture i want that's my depth of field that i want to use for my creative view then I could choose my shutter speed, depending if it's a screaming eagle going by or grizzly bears is shooting, or I want a slower shutter speed because I want some sense of movement. I could pick the shutter speed I want, and I could adjust my ISO to get my exposure. Or if I'm an auto ISO, it almost acts like shutter priority and aperture priority at the same time. I could use my exposure compensation to level it out. But typically, I'm in manual and do those things manually. So aperture priority, you set the aperture, the camera picks the shutter speed um, if your ISO is fixed. If you're an auto ISO, um, it doesn't work really as well, in my view, in aperture priority. I wouldn't consider auto ISO when shooting aperture priority. I would pick your ISO based on what you need and then adjust it to get the shutter speed that the aperture priority would give you. Shutter priority, just the opposite. You get to pick your shutter speed. And then the ISO will fine tune the exposure uh, with its internal exposure compensation. And really what it's doing is adjusting the aperture to internally in the computer to get your exposure. And then the way I shoot in manual, either with ISO adjusting exposure or auto ISO uh, adjusting exposure but if i don't have auto iso on there's no programming functions to be in effect and this confuses people if i'm in pure manual my exposure compensation button does not do anything you physically either have to change the iso the shutter speed or the aperture to get your exposure to uh, work and I sort of told what this is talking about a little bit. Uh, if you look in your viewfinder and you see down below, there's usually some kind of meter and the meter will tell you um, where your exposure, if you have perfect exposure, it's gonna be on, on zero. If you're a little underexposed, most of the meters and all of the cameras out there are in like one third stop. So if it's, if it's a little underexposed, the meter will shift to the left a little bit. If it's overexposed, it'll shift to the right a little bit. And you can see the big dashes down there in that little meter are one-stop increments. Here's the beauty of, of uh, mirrorless cameras that we really didn't have in SLRs. We could have a live histogram right in our viewfinder and sort of keep an eye on the histogram, make sure everything is going on the way we want before we press the shutter button. And that usually, I have mine called up so it's to the right and the lower part of my viewfinder. I don't use my uh, monitor in the back that much except to call up an image to maybe check something on it. And um, because those big monitors in the back kill my batteries compared to uh, just using the, the little... Uh, Viewfinder monitor. By the way, the viewfinder monitor is also better to look at when you 
pull up an image to review and you look through your viewfinder monitor at that image, you could, you're not dealing with ambient light and your image, you're looking into almost like a, a little dark room. So you could really tell if you really caught a sharp image or not. So uh, play with that, see how that works for you. Do you find, um, Gary wanted to know, he said he tried a circular polarizer on his Sony RX10 IV, but he finds that maybe it's just because it's a small camera, um, but it seems to slow his focusing down. Um, it is a little, he said, maybe it's a little better at high noon than the rest of the day, but do you find that you have a problem with it slowing down your focus? And is there a, a better way to get by there? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that happens when you add a polarizer, and that's that's a really good question, is you lose stops of light. And when you lose too many stops of light, or it'll, it gets too dark outside, the autofocus slows down while it's trying to lock onto things. So uh, the Singray polarizers maximum lose one and two thirds stops of light. And that sounds like a lot of stops of light, but most people's polarizers, and I don't know if there's one out there that is as good as sing rays as far as not losing as much light, but a lot of them will lose two and a quarter, two and a half stops of light. And that could be detrimental um, late in the day. And by the way, sometimes late in the day, that's when I switch to the Hilux filter. So I don't lose those stops of light, but I lose the ability to dial out some of the uh, polarization that I might desire. Uh, if your camera is slowing down, um, that much with a polarizer on it. It might be um, a function of the particular lens you have on it. Some of the lenses don't handle filters well at all uh, with the autofocus system. One of the things I recommend when we have our autofocus, and I like to move my sensor around in the middle, anybody's camera, anybody's camera, the center, when, they, when the autofocus sensor is in the middle, it's not great for composition. It's its most sensitive. If we move it off to the left or right or up and down, it's not quite as sensitive and it doesn't lock on quite as quickly as uh, if it's in the middle. So what you might want to do is determine what lighting that your particular camera and lens combination works well in and be ready to let's say you're shooting, shooting late in the day, you know, at and after golden hour, you might want to pull the polarizer off of that and stick on that Hilux filter. So hopefully that answers that. Okay, autofocus modes and settings. We have um, single, continuous, and manual. Um, we have you know, Nikon system, they call it dynamic autofocus. We have eye detection now. We have 3D. All this stuff came about because of mirrorless. Um, Sony actually pioneered it, and it's gotten better and better with them, as well as all the other companies, and including Nikon and Canon. Uh, it, the eye detection, animal eye detection works really well. But I'm going to get everybody out there a little mad. I shoot most of the time in the Nikon system, which is dynamic autofocus, which means that wherever my sensor is, a grouping of all the points in my camera that could autofocus are active. So if I miss a little bit, one, as long as I locked on the first time, and as long as I'm continuously firing in, a let's say, a short burst, the dynamic autofocus helps maintain the autofocus, even if something flew in front or moved in front of it briefly, it remembers the less autofocus point and holds it. So I started shooting that way back in 1995 with the, with the uh, F5 film camera. And my shooting style hasn't changed a whole lot. I do use a lot of the advanced settings in my Z9 and my Z8 and my Z6 II, uh, but my overall style is really shooting dynamic autofocus. I shoot in continuous drive. Uh, you have a choice of continuous drive and single shot. A con usually single shot is set up so you take one shot, it locks onto a subject, and then you have to release the shutter and do it again. Really popular with portraiture. Portrait could, could be a black bear sitting up on a hill or a bird perched on a branch. 
I shoot and continue to strive and leave it there all the time. I, even the Z9 shoots at 20 raw frames a second. I've learned to shoot and squeeze off one or two frames if that's all I want. But continuous strive allows me to shoot short bursts. And we'll talk about short bursts a little later, why that works for me. And I did that even with digital SLRs and even film. I was a little more careful with film because I only had 36 exposures. But yep, that's that's the way I shoot. And it's my favorite to shoot. When all else fails, dynamic autofocus is my favorite. And I shoot in continuous autofocus. Mirrorless challenges. Let's talk about some of those. And some of those are being corrected with firmware and some cameras. Some of them haven't yet. Um, up until the Z9 and probably the top of the line Canon, maybe the top of the line Sony, I haven't looked at that. Uh, when you're in continuous autofocus, you have put your autofocus sensor on something like our subject up here on the right. And my red sensor doesn't give me an indication that I locked on. I have to trust the camera did because I see it focused into view, no matter how good or bad your eyesight is, you have to trust the camera. And you do a short, which is why I do short burst, so that the camera catches up with my subject. And most of the shots in a short burst are in focus. As a matter of fact, if I shoot a burst of 10, like my Z6 II, in dynamic autofocus, 7 out of 10 in a rapid succession are definitely in focus. I might lose one or two or three in that. Now, the newer cameras like the Z9 and the Z8, that red sensor turns green when it locks onto something. I still do the same thing. I do short bursts, but I do like the fact that now they're saying, all right, it really is important to have your range finder indication, in this case, turning from red to green, letting, letting the photographer know that you're locked onto something. That doesn't mean you're locked onto the right thing. You could have locked onto a branch in the back, but at least you know you're locked onto something. Um, if your mirrorless camera is not up to the latest firmware, I would recommend you download the latest firmware from your camera company's site and make sure some of those features weren't added um, and you didn't happen to catch the announcement. So the biggest challenge in short bursts for me were that I didn't have an indication. Now, now I have an indication that I'm locked onto something makes me more comfortable. So where do you focus? Well, just like with SLRs, um, if it's a, an, an animal like this grizz, focus on the eye if you could, or somewhere as close to the eye. And, um, you know, this was shot with a 200 to 500. It was a Nikon Z7. Uh, I was at about 400 millimeters at 800th of a second. And uh, I did have a polarizer on there. That's why all that green foliage in the back because it was a little bit bright. This is about oh, maybe nine o'clock in the morning. So it was a little bright and that those leaves back there were definitely a little washed out until I polarized it. Now, here, here's the thing. When I'm shooting, you can't chase birds in flight, for example. We're going to see some birds in flight. You can't chase them around and polarize while they're flying around. You can't even do that when something like a grizzly bear or a moose comes out. What I do is when I'm set up and I'm anticipating this is where the animals are going to be, what the birds are going to be, I polarize that direction. And then I shoot. And if I have to swing my camera around because one's coming up behind me, hopefully not a grizzly bear coming up behind me. And, you know, I just don't worry. That one's not polarized. So that's no different than if I didn't use a polarizer. But if I get a few in a polarized situation, they're always a little bit better. And that means less post-processing and, and more importantly, as a photographer, and maybe because I'm an old film photographer, uh, I like the fact I'm controlling light with my filters and my camera and not relying on the post-processing for every little thing. This way my post-processing is no longer a fix-it tool, but a creative tool if that makes sense. Birds in flight. Where do I focus? I use a couple of things to get my birds in flight. Uh, I focus on the back of the neck. Why? Because when this guy's going by, I can't keep the sensor on his eye, right? But his head is sort of in plane with the back of the neck. But if I'm shooting a 2.8 lens, in this case, even a 5.6 lens, the depth of field 
if I'm if I lock onto under his wing or by his wing, um, I might have a soft eye or a little bit of a you know uh, eye that's not quite in focus. So I use depth of field to control that. If I'm shooting birds in flight, I'm going to be at f seven point one. Why seven point one? It's a long formula because I used to be an engineer before I became a professional photographer and I just couldn't bring myself to go to F8. So my recommendation is someone's around F8. If you photograph a bird in flight, um, chances are the depth of field is going to pull the eye in, even if you couldn't get the sensor on the eye. If you can get it on the head, it's even closer. Uh, when you really get good at it and you can keep the sensor on the head, I'm not saying I've never shot at F28 and didn't get a really sharp image, but most of the time we can't get the sensor on a head of a, a bird in flight. They're just too fast. And we're not stir, you know, uh, we can't be stable enough to do that. And I shoot in short bursts. And if I shoot in short bursts, I might get three or four or five images. One of those might be a little sharper. Even more important, one of those might give me an expressional change. I remember shooting this eagle uh, over Jordan Lake Dam in North Carolina, flying down the river towards the dam, to fish and i just you know let out a burst of about eight images when i got home most of them were sharp but one of one or two of them the eagle looked over at me on the shore bank i didn't even know he did it and that was my keeper because it was different than the rest i would have never got that if i didn't shoot that eagle in a short burst so those are some of the reasons i do that um keep compositional awareness in mind uh, what is our subject doing? Where is it? You know, where is it in relationship to the rest of the field? Uh, but if it's a big mammal, I'm going to go for the I'm going to go for the eye for the focus point. And you know, so I'm going to move my sensor around until I get it, get the composition of my subject where I want with the rest of the field. And so I could capture capture uh, the best possible sharpness I can. I use converters. A um, couple of common sizes are 1.4s or 1.5s, 2x converters. And some people say converters take away. Well, if you have really good glass, you, you, this sounds terrible, you can't have a $500 lens and get a converter on it and not have softer images. People get mad at me at workshops when I say, yeah, that lens probably isn't going to handle a converter well. And they say, no, look how much closer I can get. Nine times out of 10, by six months later, the, their converters on eBay being sold. But if you have a 2.8 lens or an F4 lens, or even some of the newer 5.6 lenses, the converters work really well on them nowadays. Make sure your lens works well with a converter. Practice at home before you go on a trip with me to Yellowstone so you know what your equipment can do. Hey, listen, I get a new lens. I go out front in my front yard and focus on the brick house down the road to see how my lens is doing. Um, I do that to make sure I know what to expect when I get in the field. The that's really thing. smart shooting something that's that familiar to you as well. Yes. Right. I have a couple so, of questions here that I, I think it's good yeah. timing. Um, you've said a few times a short burst. What do you consider a short burst? Just a feel for, you know, I just, I hold it down for a half a second, maybe, you know, I'm shooting at 20 frames a second with the Z9. So a half a second to a second would give me 20 images. I'm averaging about eight to 10 images in a short burst with the Z9. When I had the Z6 II, most of the time, I would average about five images. So it's just a feel. It's not a science. But if I know I got at least three or four bursts, you know, so, some cameras shoot at four frames a second. So you hold it down for a second, you're going to get four images. Right. Okay. This, um, this might be relevant too. Um, is there a benefit to getting a 24 millimeter prime or 35 millimeter prime instead of the more expensive 27, 24 to 70, and then use your feet to go from 24 to 70? Or do you have another avenue? I love the 24 to 70 um, because it gives me, and I use that quite a bit for landscape. Um, the primes are always better. Oh, and the camera manufacturers are going to beat me on the head, and so is Sigma and, and Tamron. Um, but it's true. The, my background, just so the group knows, my, my background, I used to work on NASA projects with a space shuttle. My electronic engineering background is in electronics and physics. 
there's no way even a really good a 70 to 200 to 8 is one of the best zooms i've ever owned but if there was a 200 prime it's got to be better the physics just says it so if you want to do the primes and, and switch out have at it uh but if you want a really good prime like a 70 to 200 i mean uh a, a 24 to 70 to 8 you're not going to see a difference the printing labs are going to have more error in them than your lenses and um the 7200 as a zoom is a great lens but those primes that that person just called out are incredible you know what i you know i have a nikon my z lens and it's not a top of the line lens it's a thousand dollar lens uh, I have a 14 to 30, which is really great wide angle lens. I'm getting great results out of it. You know what I miss? I, I miss, and I'm going to be getting the uh, 14 to 24 to 8. I've been out and rethinking. Nikon has some primes in the 20 millimeter range, and most of my Milky Way stuff is in the 20 to 24 millimeter range. That's what I like to shoot. So I'm rethinking to going back to primes for the Milky Way stuff. So if Annette gets mad at you for going over budget, it's Gary's fault for suggesting it. Well, it's worse <laughs> than that. When I buy one for me, guess who gets one too? <laughs> I just bought her a Z8. She yeah. thought the Z9 was too heavy, so the Z8 is much lighter. Nice. Like a baby Z9. Speaking of Annette, here's one of her shots. We talked about using converters. Here's the beauty. 7800 2.8. This was shot with her 70 to 200 to 200 2.8 at 200 millimeters 2x converter that gave her 400 at 5.6. A lot of people don't realize when you put a 2x two, a converter on uh, 400 2.8, you're losing two stops of light. That's why it's 5.6. But the depth of field is still 2.8. It's not any different than taking a 2.8 lens and putting a two-stop ND filter on it, you're going to lose two stops of light, but you're not going to change the depth of field, the bokeh that you're going to have. Look at this shot. She was photographing she was photographing that hawk having dinner up on top of the tree when that subject in the background came by and she kept shooting. I missed the shot. He said, she said, Michelle. Uh, I missed the shot. Um, she got that shot in the background out of focus, you know it's a bird, but it doesn't take away from that subject. But that 400 at 5.6, which was the 7200 2.8 and the 2x converter, did its job. My favorite wildlife lens in SLRs used to be not my 600 f4, which was a $12,000 lens. It was my $10,000 400 2.8 because I could shoot at 800 5.6, but still have the bokeh, the softness of the 2.8. And I want to do that with my Z glass, but the new Nikon 400-2.8 with the built-in 1.4 converter uh, is $14,000. So I don't, I'm 68. I don't know if I'm going to make that expenditure right now. Uh, but yeah, this is one of Annette's and this is where she focused and she was shooting and she did notice that bird coming up. If she wanted that bird sharper, she could have stopped down to what would be F8 or F11 and then that that subject in the background would have had more detail. It's the photographer's choice. You got to be creative in a field. You can't just keep thinking, I'm going to change things in software when I get home. Why don't you do it out there? And because uh, to me, that's part of the fun of it. So Paul asked a question for a Z9, I detect on, focused on bird while on limb, use pre capture, and as bird goes to flight, I follow the flight path, but the focus is off in the images in flight. Not fast enough shutter speed, stop down more. Should I use a different focus feature than eye detect? Mm -hmm. Okay. Eye detect does work as long as there's not a lot of other. Here's where eye detect doesn't work. I'm going to just state that now. If there's too many birds close together and you're focused on one, sometimes it tries to find the wrong one. All right. But to go back to why you might be missing and you look in your Nikon software and you say, wow, I couldn't get it. If you could get it on the bird and you use a depth of field of about F8, 7.1 is my magic number. That's what I do all the time. Uh, and I shoot, now I've really gotten good at it. So I could shoot birds in flight at one 200th of a second. And there's more throwaways, but I could get them. 
Go to a thousandth of a second. Go to a twelve hundredth of a second. When Annette was learning birds in flight, she'd shoot at one two thousandth of a second. And people would put their hands on their heads. I don't know if the folks could see me. Shake their heads and say, but my ISO is going to go up. So what? You get a little noise. You're learning to capture birds in flight. Run that through some noise reduction software later. It's better to have a sharp image that you could play with the uh, noise reduction later than an image that is not sharp. Uh, and then noise reduction software is, and even sharpening software is not going to help an image that was captured poorly. So did that answer everything he needed to know? And if he needs some specific Z9 things in detail, he's welcome to email me because I do teach Z9 stuff. Um, I know the camera pretty much inside and out, but I shoot mostly in dynamic autofocus. Uh, it's um, it's a great camera. It's the best camera I ever shot in the Z8, which I don't own anymore because the net took it away. Now I actually bought it for her. It's the second best camera I ever shot. And, and I did have uh, another question. Yeah, about, um, shutter speed priority. He said, for action, what do you think of shutter speed priority with or without auto ISO? And then you use EV when you have a white subject, like a bald eagle, white crest mm -hmm. on a dark background, or a dark subject on a light background, like a beaver on a river. Um, okay. On pure manual, I find that I dial buttons too much while trying okay. to capture the subject, and I can miss the shot. Try this at first. Go to full manual, go to auto ISO and full manual. And which camera is he using? Uh, he has a Z9. Okay, perfect. Because the Z9 or, or all the Nikon cameras and, and most of the other ones, you could actually change the ISO on a fly if you wanted to use it. But go to auto ISO, go to full manual, pick the shutter speed you want. 1200th of a second, 2000th of a second. I don't care what it is. Pick the aperture you need for depth of field. For example, you might want to shoot as shallow as possible, or you might want to be at f8 to make sure that you have the right depth of field. The camera will pick the ISO to get the exposure right, and your exposure compensation button on top to the right, right next to your, your shutter release, that will, and you can look at your live histogram in your viewfinder, so you don't even have to take your head away. You could see where the histogram sitting and you can see your exposure bar and you could just use the exposure compensation button to get it. So the exposure looks about right between, you know, black with detail, white with detail and the center being, being, uh, um, you know, midtone. If you're shooting birds in flight like this one, that's on the screen, it's a pure blue sky. We're not worried about depth of field because it's this trees behind it. We're worried about depth of field to make sure that the eye is sharp um, if I was going to, if I have a day like this, I just go into manual exposure. I expose, I fill the frame with the blue sky. Blue sky is about three quarters of a stop, just calibration wise. It's like green grass in the sunlight is roughly zero. So if I calibrate my camera by shooting the blue sky or metering the blue sky and it's set up, anything that flies there, unless the light changes, is going to be an exposure. You don't have to worry about it. My good friend, Chaz Glacier, he just does everything in manual exposure. He'll calibrate over something like a blue sky and everything that flies through is an exposure. But if you need a little, little computer help, then, then go to auto ISO and use the exposure compensation button to adjust it. It works every time, I promise you. Here we would talk, this one was shot in dynamic autofocus, matrix metering in manual, um, I did a short burst, so I got like six of these. Uh, I just picked one of them because they were all sharp. It was great light. Um, it wasn't a pretty, it'd be nice if there was some clouds back there. I was on a gimbal head. I was on the uh, Wimbley head, um, my favorite gimbal of all times. Um, and I, I use Gitzo tripods, but there's a lot of good tripods out there, really right stuff. And, and Gitzo are the two really expensive ones, but there's a lot of good mid-range Tripods out there, uh, Siri and and Endura. Uh, there's there's a bunch of good tripods out there. Don't go online and Amazon and buy one of those hundred dollar tripods from China. 
I mean, some of those other good ones, mid-price ones are made in China too, but don't buy one of those $100 ones. They're going to fall apart and your camera's going to fall to the floor. Invest in a good tripod. doesn't have to be a $1,000, $1,200 tripod, but you're putting a lot of money on that tripod and gimbal head or ball head, whatever you're doing. Don't chintz out there. Here, we were talking about eye detection software. This is, I had to sort of simulate what happened here to get it into the program. Um, this was a capture. I was in eye detection, and here's what happened. On the Z9, I was set to, to wide, small, dash S, means wide, small. So the detection locked on the subject and the eye, um, if I'm in dynamic autofocus, the animal detection doesn't activate. You have to move to one of the features like 3D or in this case, wide, small. So it locks onto the subject. And then a secondary little um, autofocus uh, lock on, you could see it went right to the eye. It worked perfect. I shot all morning like this. And uh, it is so good that if you look here, um, even if I look at that top left one, wide detection, small, I was focusing on the back of the bird. It actually came out of that box and found the eye. The reason I know that is because when I ran it through my Nikon software, it tells me exactly where everything is. The one below was in dynamic autofocus where I relied on depth of field. I did shoot this at f5.6 and, um, and got a pretty good image. But there's no eye detection software if you're in dynamic autofocus or AI servo in the Canon system. Here's my thing, aperture. I pick the depth of field first to show what I wanna show. Shutter speed controls my motion. And my own personal eye, I get my composition right. So I move my sensor around to get my composition right. I don't shoot everything dead center and then re-crop everything. I paid a lot of money for my Z9 or all the cameras I've bought over the years. I don't want to cut and throw away pixels if I don't have to. Do I do some cropping? Yeah, I clean up the crop in software, but I'm not cutting 25 or 30% of it because my subject was dead center and I have all this dead area. So yeah, I move my sensor around to get the composition I want, including here when when this cat was jumping over to the rock, uh, I was following the cat and panning when I got this. I was on a gimbal head, a gets a tripod. I was using a sing ray filter. I didn't polarize while he, this cat jumped. It was polarized in that direction because he was up playing amongst the rocks. So anything that direction was polarized. Shutter speed control. Faster shutter speeds freeze subjects. Um, I used auto ISO. I picked the shutter speed and the depth of field I wanted. The camera took care of the exposure with the auto ISO. One two fiftieth of a second. On the right, one five hundredth of a second. I could freeze action with one five hundredth of a second or above. I start to see some wingtip movement, like here, when I shoot slower shutter speeds. Practice this. You know, one of the ways I learned to shoot birds in flight I used to live in New Bern, North Carolina. The Noose River and the Trent River come to a head, and they call it Union Point. And there's tons of you know seagulls there. Not that I want thousands of shots of seagulls, but this kid's throwing bread at them, and they're flying crazy all over the place. That's where I practice birds in flight. I got thousands and thousands of images that I threw away there until I got the techniques down. Um, I also did this. I'm a private pilot, but I was also a radio control pilot. I used to go to the local model airplane field and photograph them flying around to learn to shoot birds in flight. For one reason uh, is most of those guys don't know how to fly a model airplane. They're so erratic. It's great to practice with, and they're bigger than a bird. So yeah, find a local model airplane field and go shoot model airplanes flying around. But listen, if you do that, and they crash. Don't photograph the crash. They get really angry at that. <laughs> I um, actually really like that shot with the motion blur because it shows the action of the bird. I mean, the bird isn't frozen mm -hmm. in the sky. It is flying. And so I really like the fact that this photo shows me that action. 
Annette and I have media credentials photographing our air shows for magazines. And uh, so when the F-18s or the Blue Angels come out, I'm shooting a thousandth of a second or twelve hundredth of a second to capture them whizzing by at, you know, uh, you know, 650, 700 miles an hour. When the prop planes come out, if I used the twelve hundredth of a second, the props would freeze and it looked like the airplane's falling out of the air. I go down and shoot at about 250 or three hundredth of a second to get prop movement when the planes are flying by. So as a photographer, it's not a point and shoot. You need to know your equipment and what to do with it. And that's why you should practice at home before you go on any adventure to learn how to quickly do it. Listen, I remember when I first got married to Annette 12 years ago, um, she bought me the first Christmas a macro lunch. She noticed I didn't have a macro lunch. I'm not a big macro photographer. I used extension tubes, but she bought me a macro lunch. I thought it was really neat. Before I took it on a shoot, even for myself, I practiced with it. And here's how I did it. I laid out a subject on the floor. They happened to be M&Ms because they were colorful. I made a big S. I focused the third in and I shot at F2.8, F5.6, F8, F11, F16, F22 to see what the lens would do. And when I was done, I ate the M&Ms. But that's okay. That's another story. But I do practice, even with how much I shoot, I practice, practice, practice. I go through my menus. If I'm sitting in my office processing and I get bored a little bit, I'll pick up a camera and go through the settings. I'll go through my menus, make sure I remember where everything is so I'm not surprised when I get out there. Here, you know, this was shot above one five hundredth of a second, probably about one eight hundredth of a second. But that's how we freeze the action to get sharp images. Like, look at his eye, look at the feathers. You know, you make the choice as a photographer to do that. So depth of field uh, is your creative choice. Uh, shutter speed is also a creative choice. Here, depth of field, I'm focused on the lioness to the right. All right. I shot at 5.6 uh, with my Z9 and see that the, uh, the lioness coming up on the left is just a little out of focus. As she got closer, came more into focus, but a little out of focus and separates the two. I'm using depth of field as my creative choice to bring my viewer, their eyes to what I want them to see, but yet still have a supporting show, subject. Shallow depth of field um, allows things like this where the background drops away. It's really, to me, important to separate an image like wildlife from the background whenever possible. Um, or something like this. I might need more depth of field. Here's my famous 7.1 because I'm focused there. I can't focus on all four. There's only one focus point. If your camera is set with five or six autofocus points come on at the same time and it grabs three or four images it's averaging the focus there's only one exact focus point the rest is controlled by depth of field here this is one of the net shots she really focused on the center one they're all close together in the same plane so even though she wasn't focused on the on the other ones um she was at f8 they were close enough where they all came in pretty sharp even with the trees around them. Compositional awareness. Things like this. Get down to your subject. Be part of their world. If I stood up and shot down on this, this subject, it wouldn't look the same. Notice I have a shallow depth of field too. This was a 400, 28 and a 2X converter um, to get that close. Keep compositional rules in mind, like rule of thirds and clean lines. To me, um, this balances out because I had two subjects. So I didn't have to shift the mama bear all the way to the right. But I used a shallow depth of field to get the background to drop away and the foreground to drop away. Notice the direction of things like flight. So I can move in this case not in the center where about the beak is, I moved my autofocus sensor to the left a little bit and caught right behind his neck. I was a five point, I mean, 7.1. Um, 
to uh, to get the depth of field to work in a shallow depth of field because telephoto lenses, even five six telephoto lenses, have an inherent if the stuff is far enough away in the background of compression that'll get that background to drop away. So notice the direction of movement or flight, like this here. This elk, this is up in the Smokies, was looking to the right. So a few minutes ago, I actually had my autofocus sensor more to the left because he was looking to the right. But as soon as he turned his head, I clicked it over to the right. I focused on his eye because that's the direction of movement for this particular subject. Well, something like this. This is I'm um, using the branches as a frame, you know, around the subject, you know, a frame within a frame. Uh, use the elements around you to be creative. We could see this stuff really clearly. What you see is what you're going to get with mirrorless cameras. Real quick story. I'll make this really quick. This was in a in the east end of North Carolina. There was a couple of eagles nesting out in a swamp. And to get there to do the photograph, I had to go with hip boots to walk out there. It wasn't deep, but I'm out there photographing these eagles flying around and including this one. And I hear, and I feel thump, thump, thump on my boot. And I look down, there's three water moccasins thumping off my boot. Um, just to make a point, wildlife photography could be dangerous. So you need to be careful. Uh, my approach is really simple. It's their home, not my home. So I try to respect it. If somebody came to my house, I expect them to be respectful of my home. If I go to their house, I expect them to be respect. I, I want to be respectful of their home. Um, I waited a long time for this year to happen. This was in the Smokies. My group, this, I was shooting myself here, but my group was, was here. Um, these bear were in the uh, back, back wood area, a couple of cubs and the mom. We waited a long time for this to happen. And my entire group got this shot or something similar to it. They were slightly different positions. Be patient with wildlife. You know, you never know what's going to happen. Um, I was photographing this gator because it was great light. And those of you that live in Florida, there's lots of gators. Uh, that one in the lower right-hand corner was that's what I set out to photograph. I didn't think anything special was going to happen. And then up above, it turned to grab what it grabbed. And it did what it did is a death roll. By the way, polarizing filter, look at the reflections, all controlled with a polarizer. And I got that, the larger image. Um, don't rush. Don't treat your wildlife or birding photography like a um, like a tourist at a at a zoo. Uh, this was at some canal river in Florida when I shot this. Another shot from the Smokies. This mama was out there. I walked out into the field and talked to her. I talked to all the animals. Um, I made sure she knew I was there. She went back to grazing the cubs went up the tree um i just kept shooting and shooting all of a sudden she lifts her head if you look at her look at the back of her neck she's not happy she's not even looking at me she was looking past me two other people a couple stopped with an with an ipad to walk out to take pictures of the bears and i left my camera gear and i backed away because she was getting upset and i stopped them at a safe enough distance and they did shots of the bears i stayed with them and she went back to grazing a little bit. Then she grunted and the cubs came down the tree and they walked away. You have to understand, even in the world of photographing macro work, we don't step on this flower to get to the prettier flower in the back to photograph. It's their home. So that's my approach to that. So here's a it's quick little check. You mentioned that that bear was looking at someone coming up behind you. My little sister is an expedition, an expedition guide on a cruise ship in Alaska and she will mm -hmm. actually take people specifically to take photos of bears. Mm -hmm. She told me recently, like she makes sure that her group stays far enough back so that everybody yep. can get a good shot. And then there'll be some other group that comes behind and scares the bears and ruins it for everyone. So yep. not yeah, only people... to be respectful and safe for you, but there's other shooters out there too. And that's why, that's why in this case, I left the equipment, walked back to them walking across the field, stopped them, pointed out that her hair on the back of her neck was up. She was getting upset because two more people came. And I said, Let's stay here. And she calmed down. Then we walked a little bit closer, not to where my equipment was. And they got their iPad shots, you know, and uh, and they were happy with that. And I got to tell them about bear behavior and stuff like that. Uh, look how deep that green is, guys. 
look how detailed the fur is. I know colleagues are going to, I'm going to get emails tomorrow. Polarizing filter for wildlife. Just saying. Um, my checklist, autofocus set to dynamic most of the time or whatever else I choose, but continuous shooting set to maximum, 20 frames a second. Uh, the the uh, Z9 has the ability of, of going up to with, with JPEG, you could go to 120 frames a second, especially if you're doing that pre pre uh, shoot uh, thing with the Z9, which works very well. But generally I stay in raw, so 20 frames a second. Manual metering with or without ISO, depending on how, how I feel like metering at the moment. And I always set whatever you do, if you change things, I always set my camera back to Vinny's normal whenever I finish a shoot. And the reason I do that is, so when I go to my next location, I take my camera out of its bag, it's where I expect it to be. So if I'm photographing here and the light changes and I have to do something strange to, to capture it, before I leave that spot and put my camera gear, my camera bag up, I change my camera back to Vinny's normal. And both of my camera bodies and my camera bag, both Z9s are set exactly the same way. So it doesn't matter which one I grab. I carry my gear in Gura gear bags. This is, you know, I use the big Gura gear bag. This is the stuff I carry. You, I like the Gura gear bag because it opens in that butterfly. But I do a lot of airplane traveling. And even the biggest bag with the biggest lenses fits in every single overhead. But I like the ability of opening half the bag at a time, especially in bad weather. Or sometimes I rent a, you know SUVs and they don't have any. And I got to take a, a car with a trunk. I can't open a bag with a big flap. Um, if anybody has questions on the Gura Gear bag and why I choose to do it, email me. I'll tell you about Gura Gear. But the, uh, make sure your backpack is a good backpack. These are the ones my wife and I use. Um, that being said. And is that long list under there, everything that fits in the bag? Oh, yeah. No, let's go I back to that. <laughs> my smallest bag, which I, I grabbed sometimes. Like if somebody said, like somebody flew me out to Texas to do a keynote presentation. I was going to do the keynote presentation and fly home the next morning because I had another appointment. I wasn't going to stay in, in Texas, unfortunately, to do some shooting, but I'm not going to go without a camera gear. So I'll take this little 16 l I could still stick a Z9 in there or a Z62 and all that stuff, all the way up to my biggest bag, which I could fit all that stuff. Um, and that's bag in the center. That's what she carries. And that's not counting the accessories. That's not counting... Um, that's not counting, you know, cable releases and things like that. Those are in the little pockets around the bag, but these bags carry a lot of things. And even that biggest one, when I was shooting, I've been shooting using Gura gear since 2010. Um, even with a 600 F4 on a pro level body and another pro level body on the other side and additional lenses, it'll fit in every overhead I ever flew in, including a De Havilland Dash 8 twin prop airplane. I'm going to Montana September 10th. We're taking a group there for 10 days. I'm flying with my Gear Gear bag and, and so is Annette. And we have to take a regional jet from Salt Lake City into Kalispell. Um, I have, nobody's going to even ask me to take that plane side. It just fits in the overhead. So that's why I use those bags. And it carries everything. If you need more than this stuff, then you need a Sherpa. You need to be you need to be Art Wolf that has a helicopter to fly him in while everybody else carried his stuff. One of the best wildlife photographers I ever met, Art Wolf. And we, oh, I went the wrong way. This way, this way. Too many buttons. Okay. I am open for additional questions or if everybody's bored with me, I, you know, you could also go and hang up on me. Um, but I'm here as long as you guys need me. We do have a couple of questions. Um, David asked for email address, and that's on the screen there. Vinny's mm -hmm. email address is on there. Check out his website. You can see um, his social media as well. Um, one of the reasons I love Vinny's social media is because he will occasionally do these he saw, she saw photos where he and his wife post two completely different images of the exact same thing. Um, and it just goes to show you that really there's no right and wrong in photography and both images are stunning. 
Um, shameless plug, sorry. <laughs> David wanted to know, um, he has a Z6 and a Z9. Mm -hmm. And he said, it's nice to hear a talk by a Nikon shooter. He's learning quite a bit. But he's an amateur who shoots primarily landscapes and would like to do more wildlife photography. Mm -hmm. Any tips for him getting out and about locally? Um, say that last part of the question. Do you have any tips for him getting started as a wildlife photographer? You know, yeah. either where, 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 does, he, where does he live? Locally. Where does he, obviously birds are the easiest to start with, but whatever you do, like if uh, you know, if you get to the Smokies, learn a little bit about bear behavior. You don't have to be a biologist. But, for example, when I first started shooting bears, I learned about bear behavior, both uh, black bears as well as grizzlies. And I just needed to know what they would do if they get upset. Like that one bear I showed with the hair on the back of its head, neck going up. I knew right away there was a potential problem. I don't try to intentionally get too close to any animal, but sometimes they come. My daughter and I um, went to Glacier. I was actually teaching a workshop with Bill Fortney and Scott Kelby, uh, and my daughter tagged along, and we stayed like three extra days in Glacier to just shoot for ourselves. And we went someplace because a ranger said, down a bridge, you're going to be able to photograph a grizzly mom with two cubs about four o'clock in the afternoon. So we scattered it out. And when we went back there, we drove up to the bridge and we got out of the car. The camera gear was in the trunk of the car. So was the bear spray. The mama bear and the two cubs were up in the part where we were parking. They were less than 65 feet away. Of course, we didn't get shots because I had my daughter kneel down and I just talked to the mama and she went back to eating berries and we waited there till she was done and she walked off. You need to know a little bit about bear behavior because even if your intention is not to try to get 20 feet from a bear and as you can stay your legal 50 yards away or so, uh, that doesn't mean they're not going to happen upon you. So you need to know when they're upset. Um, you need to know that about moose. You need to know that about black bear. Um, I don't like to photograph snakes too much. My wife says I'm afraid of big snakes, little snakes, and sticks that look like snakes. So uh, I'd rather be in front of a grizzly bear than a snake or an alligator in, instead of a snake. But anyway, learn about what you're photographing. Um, I would start with birds. Go down. If, if, if you live in an area that might have a marina, go down. It doesn't have to be a pretty bird. It could be just a bunch of seagulls. Learn some bird and flight photography using the tips that I've shown today. Uh, if you're going to try for some mammals, go to a zoo first. Um, I do a whole program on captive animal photography, and some people might be cringing because they don't believe in it. Um, but I have a lot of clients, you know, if a zoo is doing things right or a game farm is doing things right and they're inspected and they're there, I prefer if all the animals were loose and didn't have to be in those enclosures but if they're there legally and a lot of them are great for education and a lot of them are great because they're protecting a species um i don't find a problem going to shoot there i, I alongside let people know i'm shooting you know this image came from a zoo or this came it came from a captive animal um learn and practice there when i get a new lens i live 40 minutes from north carolina zoo i hop in a car run to the zoo about 3.30 in the afternoon. I don't want to shoot in the middle of the day. I shoot at the end of the day when the animals are getting antsy and want to go in and eat. The lions get up and they start walking around about a half hour before they're going to be calling to eat. And that's when I get my shots. And when I do go to a place like a zoo, I pick an animal or two and stay with them. Even if I get nothing, uh, stay with them. I don't walk through a zoo like a tourist. I might say, all right, today I'm going to photograph the giraffes. And that's what I focus on. Bring the lenses I need for that. Um, so practice there. Learn about the wildlife areas in your area. There's a lot of preserves which you could walk through and uh, and find all kinds of wildlife from, you know, blue heron to raccoons to, to you know, wild goats. I, again, I don't know where he lives, but those are some of the tips I would do. Which is exactly what I did. Don said photography is a hobby. Currently shooting a D850 and thinking of going mirrorless without mm -hmm. taking budget into consideration Z8 or Z9. Let me tell you the differences of the two. Now that I have 
both at hand, even though the Z8 is the Nets. Uh, the Z8 is about a, just a tiny bit bigger than a Z6 or a Z7. Um, and and uh, and if you uh, go that route, the Z8 is going to be really comfortable to hold. What I, I don't like about the Z8 is in digital SLR days, I always shot the D5 or the D4. I like a bigger camera. So I was happier going to a bigger camera. The Z9 has a bigger battery. And people are a little afraid. They say, oh, the Z8 or the Z6 II, the batteries don't last. I did a winter shoot in Montana. And we were shooting in the morning for three hours and the late afternoon, three hours in three feet of snow, minus 10 degrees, minus 20 wind chill, one battery getting at least 1,500 images, 1,800 images for the day. Yeah, the camera did warm up in the car in between when we went to breakfast and stuff. I'm not afraid to shoot the Z8 um, with the smaller batteries. But boy, the Z9 battery, I could shoot two days on it. You just can. And uh, otherwise, there's no difference in the camera's performances. You might like the smaller size of the Z8. Now, if you're going to buy a Z8 and add the grip to it, and so you can put two batteries in there, now you're mimicking a Z9. Buy a Z9. You know, um, that doesn't help your choice because they're both excellent. <laughs> you know, it really depends on what feels better in your hand. They both perform excellent. People say, what's your the best camera you ever shot? The Z9. Second best is a Z8. Now, you've only had it a short period of time. I got one of the first ones that hit North Carolina. Um, and Annette does most of the shooting with it, but that doesn't mean I don't shoot with it. Why is that the second best? I like the bigger battery in the Z9. That That's the only reason I like the bigger battery in the Z9. Is there a benefit to buying a 1.4X over a 2X converter? Yeah, oh, uh, the 1.4X um, for the Nikon system. Uh, the Nikon uh, 1.4X loses one stop of light. So a 2.8 lens um, becomes an F4 lens. The, two, the 2X, you lose two stops of light. So now your 2.8 lens becomes a 5.6 lens. Or your 5.6 lens... Basically, you double it, right? You're going to lose two stops of light. So if you have, if you're at five six, you're going to be roughly <coughs> f eleven. If you're at f four, you're going to be at f eight. You know, you're losing two stops of light. Um, the advantage is the one point four um, is that's the multiplier. So you know, um, you're not going to have as much reach. A two x, you're going to have a 500 millimeter lens becomes a thousand millimeter lens. So you have to sort of pick and choose. I have one of each and I pick the one that's appropriate for the light and the subject at the same time. Do you use any warming filter on your wildlife photography? I probably picked the 2X. Go ahead, Michelle, I'm sorry, I cut oh, you sorry. off. Do you use warming filters with your wildlife photography? I used to use, um, when I shot film, I definitely used an A1 for the clear filter, A1, um, an A1 uh, Nikon warming filter. Uh, I just like the extra warmth. When I moved into digital, I used my white balance as my warming filter. Um, ah, Laura's going to hit me on the head. Uh, I used to shoot exclusively the uh, Singray L LB warming polarizer i now change to the neutral polarizer because i i adjust my warming either picking cloudy which is what my camera set on all the time unless i'm shooting portraits or a if i had to go shoot a wedding i don't leave the camera on cloudy because the bride's dress gets a little yellow looking and then she gets mad at me but for wildlife and nature i leave it on cloudy even on a sunny day so if i'm forced to shoot at two in the afternoon oh goodness that's not golden hour but if you know if a moose comes out at two in the afternoon i'm going to take a photograph i'm not going to say hey buddy you got to come back at 4 30. so i like that warmth that gives me by shooting in cloudy even on a sunny day i have used my white balance as a creative tool Sometimes I'll pick a funky one like fluorescent on a sunset because it's a boring sunset and it'll give me a, fun a funky purple sunset look. Just be creative with it. But I always put it back to Vinny's normal later. And Vinny's normal is keeping it on cloudy for warm and using a neutral polarizer. And now the Hilux filter does add a little warmth. 
and I don't care. I like a little extra warmth. So uh, it does add just a little bit of warmth as well as contrast. Yeah, I was going to say that the Hilux filter, it has this subtle warming effect. Mm -hmm. Some people buy it for that subtle warming effect and then yep. other people buy it just for protection and they don't care about the warming effect, but it's so subtle that it kind of works for both purposes. Right. And so you could either leave it on cloudy and use the, the Hilux filter with the warming effect or put it back on sunny. You know, you could put it on sunny and use the warming filter to get the warmth you need. Um, just depends on how much warmth you want. You know, uh, you could fine tune it with your white balance because that's guys, white balance is nothing more than a digital set of filters in your camera. It's not this mysterious thing. Um, can you re-explain the focus squares, like the green and red? If the outer square is red, but the inner square is green, is the red square out of focus and the green square is in nope. focus? No, let's get to an ex that example. Good one is that one bird, like, like this one here. Um, here, I was focused on the back of the bird, like I typically do, and... Uh, uh, in, in this case, it locked onto the bird. So the overall bird is in focus, but not necessarily the eye. Remember I said when I shoot in dynamic autofocus, I shoot at 7.1 quite a bit. So the depth of field pulls the eye in. With eye detection, animal eye detection, I could focus on the big section of the bird, which is easier to capture when we're trying to track a bird in the sky. And the eye detection fine tunes. So the big box brings the bird into the best focus the big box could bring it into, then the little box focuses that eye even sharper. So it's not two focuses, it's two focus points. One starts the focus process, the other one finishes it. Here's the problem. If there was two blue herons flying close to each other, that little green box might grab the other eye, even though you're trying to focus on this one. So you got to be a little careful with that when two subjects are close together with animal eye detection. Hey, the, the cameras are really, really good. They even have automobile detection. So if you're shooting a race, it the algorithm finds a car and locks onto a fast moving car like a NASA, ra uh, NASA car race. So does that answer his or her question? I think so. I love what you said, too. I, I do a lot of work in technology as well, and I look forward to seeing what AI and all of that technology does for cameras and photography. That mm -hmm. I think is really exciting. That is sure. You know, it's really funny because some people are saying, well, now we know, you know, uh, I just had this discuss discussion a little bit with Tony Sweet was trying to say, oh, is AI going too far? But way back in the beginning of digital, like when I first got my first D1X, you know, the big thing was, wow, people are working on software at home. Is this really the full image that, that that there's a big stick behind the head of the bird and they take it out? That's not real photography. You know, we went through that in the early 2000s. This is just another level of that. Enjoy the art as art. Now, if I'm a photojournalist, it should be what I shot is what's there because I'm a photojournalist. But if I'm a creative, artistic photographer, then man, do what you want. Just be honest about it. You know, I tell this little story when I used to do commercial work, one of the, some of my clients and I had some good clients, Hatteras Yachts, uh, ECB Bank, Community Bank Shares Bank, uh, American Heart Association. And if ECB Bank had me shoot their annual report and they said, and, and usually I got hired because they wanted some kind of nature or theme to their annual report. And they said, hey, we got a fountain in front of that bank. We want an elephant in it. I'm not going to say no. I'm going to say whatever it takes to finish that project and get my check. So I'd go put in Photoshop an elephant in their pond. The other option is getting a trainer that'll walk an elephant into the pond when that's not going to happen in a commercial shoot, not at the level I was shooting. So yeah, it's different photography for different folks. As a wildlife photographer, um, some of us, or a nature photographer, there's folks out there that say, oh, AI might be, way too much well maybe hdr is you know i know like, folks that still shoot on film because they're purists and that's how they want to shoot and that's it, it's wonderful either way well you know something i used to shoot weddings with film and i'd shoot especially when i was using flash 
one stop overexposed to make sure that bride's dress was white. And then I re relied, now this film, right? I'm a purist. The printing lab would make the adjustments to make sure the skin tones and the dress was right and let the rest of it fall into what it is. So a lot of the things we do in Photoshop, the printing labs used to do when they got our film strip and printed. Ansel Adams was a manually uh, post-processor. He spent more time in a dark room on a single image than he did on the field capturing that image. So it depends on where you want to dig. Me, just in, to me, I'm just going to enjoy the image. Guys, it's not, it's not getting the cover of a magazine. I've gotten a few covers. And I, my very first cover, I have to admit, my head swelled so big I couldn't get out of my office for three days. But in reality, in reality, that's not what your photography is about. What I tell my folks in my workshops, if your image, when you show it to a family, friend, a colleague, anybody, and they say, gee, I wish I was there, or I want to go see that someday for myself, then your image told a story and did a good job. And especially if you didn't have to use more than two or three words to explain your image. Tell a story with your image. Don't worry about the other stuff. Be a good photographer and be a good steward. Next, Paul said, um, I see you shoot with a tripod and Wimberly gimbal. Mm -hmm. It's a great gimbal. It seems hard to move around quick enough to capture fast animals. Do you ever use a monopod or go freehand? Yep. Um, if, if you were in my workshop 10 years ago, I would have said I shot everything 90% or better at a time on a gimbal or a tripod. Certainly if I do uh, if I do landscapes, I'm always on a ball head on a tripod, but for wildlife. Um, as VR got better, and as I got better panning um, with things like birds in flight and moving animals. So whenever possible, I do like to go on a gimbal head, particularly with mammals, because they're not running around like a bird is flying around. I do most of my bird and flight photography um, predominantly handheld now. Um, I usually, my setup is, is to have one setup on a gimbal head when I can for things that are sitting slow or maybe perched across the other side of a lake or, and I keep one setup on my shoulder. So like a 500 or 600 might be on the gimbal head um, with one Z9, the other Z9 is over my shoulder, maybe with, uh, you know, 100 to 400 or 70 to 200 with a 2X converter. Uh, so I have the option of swinging around, taking a shot. And uh, um, that's that's my style. Now, out of all the gimbal heads I use, you know, and, and, I, and I have to, you know, Wimbley's a sponsor, but none of my sponsors, including Singray, I was using this stuff long before they were a sponsor and we blended it into my workshop programs. Um, it's more like I sponsor them, not that they sponsor me, uh, because it's really good stuff. I have uh, my, the newest Wimbledon head, which came out in the mid, mid 2000s. Uh, I'm still using that same head. There's no slack, no nothing, no, no wiggle in it. I've tried other heads and did reviews on other heads. And after two months of using it, it still was okay, but it was a little wiggly. Now there's some heads that are also really good out there besides Wimbley, but I'm not moving away from Wimbley, whether they are a sponsor or not. I've been at that factory. It's the best customer service I've ever seen uh, in a gimbal head. It's sort of like Singray's customer service. They jump over backwards to make sure it's right. Even if it costs them money. Uh, those are the companies I want to stand with, you know, I'm going to pick on Nikon for a minute. The, D, D, the Z800s had some problems and people are yelling and screaming. You know what? A lot of the problems that they had, you know, like the lenses not fitting quite on right and stuff like that were really QA problems, not design problems, but QA problems from subcontractors that make those parts. And, you know, you can't look at every single one that close that comes out of a factory when you make it thousands of things. I applaud Nikon for doing an immediate recall, which cost them thousands and thousands of dollars to fix that stuff. That's when I know a company is standing behind their product, when they're not trying to wiggle out of the problems. You know, and uh, I've been shooting Nikon since 95, 
Canon, they're a great company. They stand behind their products. I don't have any type of relationship with Sony. But, you know, these companies wouldn't be here if they weren't great companies. You actually segued into my next question perfectly. <laughs> People were having problems with the Z9 update, so I have not updated it. Should I do it now? Um, I'm about to update mine. I held off myself <laughs> <laughs> because... You know, I didn't get a chance to do it and people had some problems. So I'm lucky. I have two Z9s. I'll update one of them and shoot it for a week before I update the other one. Um, and if I don't like it, I'll go back to the other one. You know, you know, I'll, I'll go back to the firmware. Um, I believe uh, they've worked out the bugs of the firmware. And then, listen, guys, if you have two cameras that are the same, if you happen to be lucky enough to have that, and you're going to do a firmware upgrade from your company. Don't do both of them at once until you see if you like what's happening with the firmware. Everybody can't stop and wait for somebody to figure it out because then nobody would upgrade it, upgrade the firmware, and then they'd never find the problems. But yeah, software is a little trickier. Our cameras are more computer-like than ever before. We didn't see some of these issues back in SLR days, because we were dealing with mechanical shutters and we could always just shoot, even if some of the special features didn't work quite right. We weren't stuck. Right now, all cameras have to work as a computer perfectly. And that's why you hear people, it's like my camera froze up, I had to take the battery out and, and discharge it for a half hour and then, then it never failed again. It's a computer, we've all had computers freeze up. Our cameras are computers. And that's unfortunate, that part of it is unfortunate. You know why? Because I could take my F5 film camera and shoot the same way, get the same image. You sound a lot like my auto mechanic right now. He would really <laughs> rather the computers weren't there. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a lot of value. There's, we have a lot of features now that we couldn't have. But boy, oh boy, the physics of photography, guys, has not changed. You have to have that, that little triangle for exposure. Now, in film days, we couldn't do anything about the ISO. Whatever film you put in there, we could push it a stop. You know, we could shoot a, a 100 ISO film at 200. That's it. Once the film was in there, the only thing you had to change was your aperture or your shutter speed to control your exposure. Now we could play with ISO, aperture, and shutter speed, and we could be more creative with it. So, yeah, digital and now mirrorless have given us more creative controls. And, you know, sometimes we, we have a computer problem. So then we reset it. And then it's okay again. Um, I'm still shooting with a Nikon D500 and frankly wonder if Nikon will make a mirrorless baby Z9 like they did with the D1, D2, D3 and the D100, D200, etc. If not, which Z camera comes closest to the D500 and do any take any optional extra battery? He's looking for more images and better balance with a long lens. If I wasn't going to buy a, a, a Z8 or a Z9, because of course, the Z8 is 4,000, the Z9, I forget, 55 or close to 6,000. Um, my favorite mirrorless camera, um, and this is whether you were going to go, the, the D500 is a crop sensor camera. Um, if you had cropped lenses you're going to use the adapter for, then I would go with a Z7 because it's 48 megapixels. And when you crop that, you still got roughly a 20 megapixel camera. But my choice would be the Z6 II. It's a great camera and it's two grand. Uh, you could get a refurb for $1,500 from Nikon. Uh, it's a great camera. And that's what I would go to, even though I'm used to a crop sensor. Uh, camera like the D500, the, the Z6 II is a great wildlife camera. It shoots fast, locks on well, uh, very little throwaways uh, when I shoot my little short bursts. And that, that's my recommendation. Now, Nikon does have the, the Z30, which is a crop sensor camera, but it is a prosumer camera. It's designed for somebody just moving out of shooting with an iPhone and want a camera with interchangeable lenses. You won't like that if you're shooting a D500. You just won't like it. It's not rugged enough. It's not, it doesn't shoot as fast. Um, great image quality. Um, and it's about $500 or $600. It's not super expensive compared to today's world. Um, 
but you're used to a professional level camera now, the D five hundred. Uh, I would just I would just go put the right lenses on a Z six two, and go after your wildlife with that. Unless you could, you know, if you could afford a, a you know a Z a Z eight or a Z nine, and go for that. Do you use a warmer, a warming collar on the lens when shooting in Montana at 10 below? Say that again, I'm sorry. Do you use a warming collar on the lens when shooting in Montana at 10 below? <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, but if I used less expensive lenses, and it's not, some of our less expensive lenses really work well. But when you're shooting some of the better lenses, they're not prone to get sticky out there. There's you know, on, on the track, like for zooming in and out. Um, um, this is more, more um, metal in the track, in, internal to the lens to prevent that from happening, from sticking in cold weather. So I was shooting uh, in cold weather, a prime. So I have to, I didn't have to worry about a zoom for that. Um, and that had no problems in the cold. And I also shot, the 200 to 500 on the FTZ adapter. Uh, so I had a little zoom capability that didn't have any sticking. Uh, but uh, Annette and I carry as an emergency piece, an old 28, an older, it's not that old, but 28 to 300 F56 Nikon lens. And we carry that with us in case one of our lenses go bad. We know we can throw that on an FTZ adapter and put it on any of the Z cameras and at least finish a shoot. If you know one of us dropped the lens or something like that, at least it gets out to 300 millimeters. So playing with that in the cold weather, just to see how it worked, we did notice that was getting a little sticky. And, and that was due to the cold. A lot of that has to do with cold and what dampness is in the air. But the other lenses, we had no problems with. And they were out there sometimes for three hours and uh, with no problem. One day we were out and it was snowing on us. So the camera was full of snow. I had to keep wiping it off. To, to be able to see through the viewfinder and keep the lens clear. And no, we had no problems with that at all. And with flash, do you use auto ISO or single ISO? When I'm using flash, I don't use auto ISO. I use I set the ISO the way I need it. I set the flash unit up. Now, I don't use flash as much as I used to. I use it more when I'm, uh, when I'm photographing uh, like uh, St. Augustine, Florida has a has the, the alligator farm there. Not so much for the alligator farm or zoo, so to speak, but because they have a natural rookery that between January and somewhere around the end of May, there's a lot of nesting birds. And they actually form the rookery there, the birds, because the alligators protect them from other predators like raccoons and stuff like that, uh, protect the nests. Uh, you know, unless a bird falls in the water, a gator is not going to climb the tree to get a bird out of a tree. So um, the rookery has been tremendous for the photographers there. And um, um, and and that's a, another great place to practice birds in flight. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I'll go there and, and do that type of shooting there. But no, um, um, that's probably pretty much pretty much it. I think I answered the question, but I sort of got lost in my story a little bit. You can remind me here. I think so. Um, Andy wanted to know, he said, Vinny mentioned that you move the polarizer like in your elk image. So do you adjust to taste? I move the polarizer. Yeah. I wonder if he's talking about when you twist the polarizer and it adjusts how much polarization you get. Okay. Yeah. And that's actually a really good question. A lot of people think a polarizer is on and off. In other words, if they're going to use a polarizer, even in landscape, they go full polarization. No. Look look through your viewfinder, or if you're using live view on the back, look through it. Move the polarizer slowly, unlike an SLR where you're looking physically looking through the lens. You have to wait for the video to catch up to your polarizer a little bit. And a better camera you have going from, you know, a, a, a Z5 to a Z9, the better camera you have, the faster that reacts. So turn your polarizer of polarization until you get to the effect you want. Um, it doesn't have to be full polarization. It has to be enough to tame the light to get what you want. The polarization on a bird 
that might have, especially if you have to shoot earlier than golden hour, a polarization on a bird means scattered light, like a white egret, uh, scattered light amongst those feathers. If I could tame that down just a little bit, if the light happens to be the right direction and the polarizer does help, um, you'll find that the image looks sharper than it really is. Some people say my image is out of focus. And what I found is it was a little overexposed because the light was too bright on the white egret and it looked like it bloomed a little bit. So a polarizer sometimes takes that away and it gives the appearance of a sharper image. One of my favorite ways to explain a polarizer to someone who's never used them is if you recall wearing a pair of polarized sunglasses and you turn your head 90 degrees, you will see the color of the sky change. I have a friend who is a fishing instructor and he uses polarized sunglasses to remove the glare on the water so he can see where the fish are. So next time you're wearing a pair of polarized sunglasses, turn your head slightly and that'll give you somewhat of an idea of what a polarizing uh filter can that, do on the end of your camera. That is great advice. Uh, and if you don't happen to own polarized sunglasses, because I don't, because pilots, we can't use those in the cockpit because then you can't see your instruments. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, um, uh, you could also take your polarizer. And you don't have to have it on the camera. Hold it up and turn the polarizer and see if it has an effect. If there's glare on the water, see if it takes the water away. If it does, then put it on your camera and use it. Um, did you switch all of your lenses to Z, Z lens or did you use the adapter? The only lens I kept as an F mount lens is my 500 PF. I'm considering getting rid of it and getting to 400, 4.5, because that really works well with the 1.4 converter, uh, which gives me 560 instead of five um, as a small package lens, but it's really hard to give up this 500 PF. It's an incredible lens. It's also a $3,500 lens, so it should be incredible. Um, I have uh, the 180 to 600 on order. It's not an S lens for those that are using an icon system. So I am going to test it in the camera shop. I have, you know, being MPS member, you know, I should get priority. I'm hoping it shows up before I go to Montana, but I'm going to test it in the camera shop. That camera shop knows that if I don't like it, I'm not going to take it, but they don't care because it just means they got an extra lens to sell that it's hard to camera stores to get them at first. So um, that's really got to perform well in the parking lot of the camera store for me to, to <laughs> move out my 500 PF and go to the new 180 to 600. Awesome. All Excellent. right. I think that's it for all of our questions. Okay. Um, if anyone would like to reach out to Vinny, check out his website. There's links on his website to social media. His email address is there. Um, if you don't know his web address, go check out singray.com. And right in the menu, we have a list of all of our ambassadors, including Vinny. Uh, so he is very easy to find and he is very open to your questions and communication. So, Vinny, I do want to thank you so much for being with us tonight. Well, That's I appreciate, again, the the invite from Singray because, you know, Singray uh, does a great job in letting us ambassadors teach and not necessarily have to be about Singray filters. They want to educate you guys in photography. That's what we're here for. Uh, I want to thank Michelle. Great introduction. I guess I got to send you five dollars. Uh, it's uh, always a pleasure. And all you folks out there spending, you know, your time with me when you could be, you know, with your loved ones or watching TV. So um, keep them shooting. And if you need me, give a holler. All right. Thank you, everybody, for being with us tonight.